introducing uh, some things. Uh, find uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. You know, I know uh, uh, we were coming here for quite a while you know, as Brother Bramplett was in uh, the States, and so we preached for, for a fair while. And, uh, and Brother Edmund uh, t- uh, took us out to have lunch. And he said, uh, he says, when you first came, he says, uh, I was sitting back there and you're talking. He says, and I and, uh, heard you say, uh, yeah, I, no, as you're talking, I thought, well, who is this man that talks so long? Yeah, I guess uh, Brother Bramplett doesn't you know, go quite as long as I do. And I'm, and I'm sorry for that. And, yeah, that's why I said you're glutton for punishment. I've, I'm back. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, and so, you know, we, uh, we try to do what the Lord has asked us to do. And, you know, we've, and so I guess uh, that's becoming more and more uncommon. It seems like, you know, preachers do what God tells them to do. And so I might preach a little longer this morning. I'll, I'll try to keep it as low as I, or, or low as I can, uh, you know, and uh, keep you in, uh, closer to a time limit. But, you know, uh, it's amazing how God speaks to hearts. Yeah, and uh, you know, for Betty and I, uh, you know, we've been in Australia now for over 40 years, and uh, we've been uh, starting churches, trying to help churches, doing whatever we can, whatever God told us to do. And now He's got us uh, doing a ministry where we're going to the small towns of Queensland, and we're just trying to reach them with the gospel, trying to help uh, towns that have no churches, or at least don't have a good church. And, uh, and so we're not going to any major towns and we're not going to go to like Roma or a place like that. Uh, we're trying to influence the little towns and uh, hopefully through that God will raise up a people that can influence the bigger towns. But you know, there's so many towns in Queensland that uh, you've driven past them and you just see a little town here and there, 200 people, 300 people. And you look there and if you see a church, it usually says meeting once a week or once a month, not a week, once, once a month. And sometimes there's no churches. You go by and you see what the church is actually turned into a gift shop or a coffee place. You know, and God, uh, people are not reaching these places. And this is what God's touched their hearts because he reminded us uh, how that we drove all over the place when we were here all this time, going through the little towns and no one goes. You know, uh, how many uh, you know, American missionaries come here and go to a little town? Hardly anybody, if they do. Uh, you know, I think there we have, uh, I can't think. No, not Will Height. Uh, Jim Heberly. Yeah, he's doing something like that. Uh, but how many Australians are going off into a little town to start something? Hardly anybody. You know, uh, we, we stay in the big cities because we have bigger chance of being an influence. But... They're dying, going to hell, and no one cares, it seems like. And that's, this is what we're doing. So we're going into these little towns. We have now gone from uh, the Bruce Highway, and we're now past Dalby. Uh, where next little town we're going to be going into is Brigalow. And so we'll be going through there, passing out literature, knocking the door, just trying to reach somebody, and, uh, you know, and try to uh, be an influence for Christ. So you pray for us as, as we go. I mean, uh, people say, well, uh, yeah, how long are you going to be able to do this? You look, start to look like you're a little bit older. Well, I'm a little bit older, but you know, the gospel hasn't changed. Uh, you know, Moses didn't start his ministry until he was 80. So, yeah, I'm still young. I haven't even got there yet. So I'm, uh, and you, if you, you might say, well, Brother Larry, yeah, how long are you going to be able to do this? Well, I'll tell you what, why don't you come join us and find out? And you then we'll find out, you know, what our Christianity is all about. But anyway, let's uh, let's look, read here this morning to uh, you know one Kings chapter nineteen, and we're going to uh, look at verse nine, and uh, reading down a few verses here. I like Elijah. Elijah of all the prophets seems to capture my imagination, uh, kind of moves me as much as any any prophet ever uh, has. And so I speak about him quite often. But in verse 9, it follows along as I read here. It says, And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken uh, thy covenant, 
thrown down thine altars, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mount, uh, mountains, and it break in pieces and rocks uh, uh, the, before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering into the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altar, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I... Even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return to thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest to uh, anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of uh, Nimshi, uh, shalt thou uh, anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphath, of uh, uh, Abela Hola, uh, shall thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escaped from the sword of Hazel shall Jehu slay. And him that escaped from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Uh, yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphath, uh, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth, uh, and Elisha passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, Lord, we read scripture, but Lord, uh, the scripture in its reading of itself means nothing unless the Spirit of God takes the word of God and deals with the heart. Lord, I ask again that, Lord, you'd fill me and use me. Lord, I pray that the, the Spirit of God might work freely here in our midst. Lord, we need thee. We truly do. In this day and hour, when we see the, a world in confusion, Christians seem to be in disarray. Lord, we need now to fall back upon the Word of God and there uh, be settled and established uh, in our goings because of what thou sayest. Lord, I ask that you be with us now. Take this uh, message, and Lord, help us somehow uh, to see what's coming along. And Lord, help us to see where we are. But Lord, help us also to see Christ. Lord, I ask that you bless us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, has uh, anyone here ever done a strength test? Uh, maybe, and, uh, you know, when you're uh, in grammar school or something, where they had to had you hold weights out in front of you and just hold your weights, yeah, and see how long you could uh, you could weigh that, yeah. I remember as, as a young man we had that, and and so uh, the uh, the PE teacher that we had gave everybody a one pound uh, now bar. Says now hold hold it out there, and I thought one pound, man. Yeah, I thought I was a strong kid, and I said nah. I'll take five pounds. My PE teacher looked at me and said, okay, you take your five pounds. He let me do it. Yeah, everybody else got one pound. I've got five pounds. Ah, look at that. Yeah, I'm looking around like, ha, ha, ha. All of a sudden, that five pounds turned to 20. And that five pounds started to turn to 50. I'm looking at my, my friends who are, I didn't think it was strong as me, and they're holding that one pound out there, and that five pounds starting to do this, and I couldn't hold it. I'm trying to hold it. I'm doing everything I can, and I started to put my hand. He said, "No, no, no, Larry, one hand." And I'm sitting there trying to endure, and I'm watching the faces of my friends, and they're, and I'm, yeah, my grimace is different, yeah. And I found out that that weight 
just cannot, cannot be contained here. But I did all I could. My father taught me, you get a task, you finish the task. You know, and there, there it was, and I'm going ah, and I couldn't, and I was the first one down. You know, my arrogance, and I guess my decisions uh, to do it my way, you know, overrode what the teacher was trying to, to, to bring out into us. You know, and so I failed in my attempt only because I wanted to do it my way. You know, and you might say, Brother Larry, what does that have to do with Elijah? Because, you see, Elijah was a prophet, you know, and he had a mantle. And this mantle that, that he carried, uh, you know, was a rough type skin. And I know this is a towel. This isn't a, my mantle. Uh, but he was known for this mantle. He really was. Yeah, everybody knew. Uh, some come along, they'd say, who's that coming? They'd look and say, oh, that's Elijah by the mantle. It's, they recognize this before they recognize the face usually. And they'd see him coming. They knew that. You know, and, you know, and so uh, you know, here Elijah is, and he's running from Jezebel. And he's there uh, you know, with uh, this heartache because he has just won a victory for God. I and mean, he's put down the prophets of Baal. He's had a celebration. I mean, uh, he's called in the rain. And, uh, and so he's had this great victory. And now Jezebel says, you know, I'm going I'm to kill you before night's out. Ooh. You think a guy who's just did all he's done would say, come on, sister, bring it on. Let's see what happens. But no, no, he runs for his life. It's amazing how that when you think you're the strongest, you probably you're weakest. And you better have the dependency on, on, uh, upon uh, yourself uh, that is only in God. And you look to him. And so Elijah took off running. But he's running with this mantle on, his, on him. And he takes off. He gets in the wilderness. And he finds a juniper tree, which is not a really a, a tree. And he's found a place that's not really shady. He's found a place where there's no rest and comfort. And there... Uh, he lies down. He says, oh, better if I'd never even lived. But the whole time he's doing it with this mantle on him. You know, and as, he, as he's doing this, he, the angel comes, feeds him, gets him prepared, says, you've got to go a little farther. And he goes off, and he gets to the place where uh, you know, he comes to this cave. And God shows up in this cave. And God speaks to him. And this is where God's brought him. He didn't want him out there in the desert, but... You're out here, so come meet me in the cave. And so he comes to the cave, and he's got this mantle on. You know, and so there he is in the, in the cave, and, he's, and, and, and God says, okay, stand out in the front. But he asked him a question before he did it. He says, what are you doing here? Oh, I've been very jealous for the Lord. Oh, your people are trying to kill us. Your people are, are tearing down everything you've built. Oh, Lord, I, I'm the only one still standing. And he's saying this to God with his mantle on. Yeah. And, and as he's doing God says, okay, get to the front. He goes out the front. And as he's there and he's looking, here comes a wind. But God's not in the wind. Here comes an earthquake, but God's not in the earthquake. Here comes a fire, and God's not in the fire. You know, God's not always in, in the thing that seems to be the most, uh, how can I say, enormous, so big, so uh, awe-inspiring. But it says God was in a still, small voice, which is able to speak to his heart. And when the still, small voice he puts his hand over his face. And God says, what are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah, with your mantle on? He didn't say with your mantle on, but he said, what are you doing here? And it, he's got his mantle on. What are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. What are you doing here? I've been very jealous, of the Lord. And he starts, he, re, he recites the same thing again. You know, as a Christian, you know, how, how many times is your answer to God a road answer? Oh, Lord, I, I, I'm trying to serve you. I'm trying to serve you. But in your heart, 
Are you really trying to serve him? It's a wrong answer. People come up to us and they meet us in church and they have, they, 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 you did to me this morning. And he says, uh, uh, Brother Larry, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. And that's, that's the right answer. But my knees are aching. Uh, you know, my head's a little more cloudy. Uh, you know, there's less hair in my head. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of things about me that's not good. But I'm good. That's my road answer. That's your road answer for most things. And yet we do this, and yet, you know, uh, do you realize that you, you wear a garment every time you, you come to this place? You wear a garment, and sometimes you might be known for that garment. And God uh, said to Elijah, he says, okay, now you need to go find Hazel and anoint him over Syria. You need to find Jehu, anoint him as king, but you've got to go find Elisha because I'm done with you. You've got to find your replacement. And because you're here and not where you should be, I'm done. I'm taking you home to heaven with me. But I want you to go and find Elisha and pass on your mantle. It's not yours anymore. Churches today are, are going through one of the worst plagues we've ever seen of finding men and women of God who will stand up and be in the fight. You're, you're experiencing something here yeah, and, you know, and it's something that's plaguing all of Australia and most of America, I, I'd say probably the world, trying to find somebody to come up and pastor, to preach. Yeah. And so, yeah, I'm in my 70s, and so here I am, I'm uh, you know, getting toward the end of my life, and I've got a mantle. God gave me this mantle. You know, and, uh, and so I've been trying to live by this mantle, but, you know, I'm trying to find a replacement for me as well. You know, I, we started a number of churches here in Australia, but the biggest problem we've always had is trying to find somebody to take the place of the one who started that church. You know, and so we just can't find anybody. And so I've gone out here and I said, hey, can I give you my mantle? You know, would you take up the, the, the job? Will you, will you come and do the work? You know, and oh, no, no, no. I can't do that. You see, I, I'm getting ready to go into software. You see, uh, I, I've learned I can be a millionaire shortly here because I know how to work computers and everything else, or I know how to do this, or, and no one wants to take this mantle. It's not profitable. Did you notice that when God uh, you know, calls people, he finds busy people, and he interrupts their lives? You know, uh, as we read here, here's, here's Elijah, Elisha, and where's he at? He's plowing in the field. And God says, drop it all and start serving me. Well, wait a minute, can I kiss my mom and dad? Can I say goodbye? But do what you want. It's up to you. Free will is an amazing thing, but is your will surrendered to God? The story I gave about holding that weight out here in front of us is a hard thing. But people who want to endure, people who are taught to endure, will try to do the best they can. And they'll hold that weight. But the people who are wimpish, the people who have never been taught to endure, will do it for a little while and say, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's just a weight. You know, it doesn't matter if I'm the first one down, the last one, or the last one down. It doesn't really matter. It's just, it's just a small test. And so I'll put my hand down, save my strength. But that's a character flaw. And too many Christians have a character flaw that they cannot uh, serve God because they're, they're using their self-will to do what they want to do. But now, I don't know about you, but when I received Jesus Christ as my Savior, I surrendered all. I didn't say, Lord, uh, you know, I'll, I'll love you and I'll serve you and I'll, I'll be the Christian you want me to be as long as it's convenient. And God interrupted my life early on. And God said, I have a job for you. And I, you know, I had plans. 
And God interrupted all my plans, all the things I was wanting to do. God interrupted it. And he says, okay, I want you to go to Australia. I didn't even know where Australia was. I didn't. I didn't know it. I had hardly been out of my own state. I'd never got on the airplane until I came here. I'd, I, I'd never done any, uh, anything governmental, uh, well, I guess, like paperwork or anything else until I started getting visas. I didn't know what all this stuff was. And they wanted uh, you know, records of who my father was, who my mother was, who my dog was. It seemed like anything that came along. They wanted to know about it. They wanted, to, uh, they wanted me to get a, a, a police report to show I wasn't a criminal. And, oh, man, and all the stuff. And I don't know what in the world I'm doing. And so here I am, interrupted. You remember Peter? He's out there, washes the nets. God comes along and says, thrust me out a little ways and hold on to the boat. Thrust him out. He interrupted his life. He says, come follow me. Leave the nets. Leave the boat. He interrupted someone's life. Yeah. Does God have the right to interrupt your life? That's a, that's a question to ask. You see, this hairy uh, garment that he wore, you know, it was something that he was recognized by, and it's something that people knew him by. And, uh, you know, but... We're starting to replace these old, stinky, hairy, itchy garments by robes, finery, you know, you know, something that looks like it's fashionable, you know, something that shows you're cool. I want you to look at something. Look over 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Yeah, you know, we'll look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Maybe this is because I'm old, or getting old. I don't like to think I'm old. Everyone tells me I am. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, listen to what it says in verses 9 and 10. Here is the preaching of Paul. Listen to this. You think about it. someone standing in the pulpit today preaching like this. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Uh oh you're just telling some people not going to heaven. Look what else he says. Be not deceived, neither fornicators. Uh-oh. You're talking about sexual action there. Nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves or mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. You know, how often you hear people uh, today standing in the pulpit saying, hey, you're drinking, you're a drunkard. You out here, you're playing around with another woman, another man. You're in fornication. You're in adultery. It's sin. It's wrong. It's terrible. You shouldn't be there. And yet, we're allowing things inside the church that should never be there because we're not willing to have a mantle. This is, I belong to God. And we can't pass this mantle on because who wants to carry this kind of a mantle? Give me a robe. Give me, give me a place that I can be cool. Give me a, a place where I can be uh, the preacher that you know, shows that he's got love in him. You know, my daddy, I know this doesn't go along with modern day training methods of children. My daddy used to spank me. And it was never lightly. You know, didn't he understand how, how young a boy I was? And... You know, he'd come to me sometimes when, it, when I'd done something. He never did anything where I didn't do anything wrong. But I always wanted to do something. And he came to me, and it was like Zorro. He'd take that belt and... And here he came. You might say, oh, abuse, abuse. My dad loved me. And my dad's heart broke every time he, he would spank us. You know, and my dad had some things that I believe were right. Maybe he didn't do, always do it right because he wasn't a Christian. But he had some things that were right. And he taught me to be my father's child. He taught me to live up to that name. And yet, you know, here we want a Christianity that says, hey, don't say bad things about people. Let them feel a little more comfortable. Because if they're comfortable, maybe they'll, if they come along church, they'll hear some good things. 
what they need to hear is they're sinners lost before God without, without hope. They need to re receive Jesus as their Savior. Uh, there's a hell out there. And if they do not repent and come to Christ, they'll be lost forever. You know, and yet we want to tone this down. Come make a decision for Jesus. We put on these frilly robes. I heard my pastor talking about old-time preachers. He said, you know, the old-time uh, independent Baptist preachers you, uh, got into the pulpit, and when they got in there, uh, these, these were eloquent men. They didn't, they didn't have a good command of the English language. Uh, they didn't know how to dress. It seems like they come in there with uh, plaid uh, you know, green pants and, a, and an orange uh, checkered uh, coat, and it seems like their teeth didn't, uh, didn't fit in their mouth. And they'd sit up there and they'd say things like, uh, like D.L. Moody. He said Jerusalem with one syllable. How do you do that? I don't know how you say Jerusalem with one syllable. Jerusalem. That even sounds like two. But that's what they said. And that was the way the old preacher did. And they'd stomp and they'd rant and they'd sweat and they'd go off. And, you know, but people were being converted and changed. And yet we want a religion that's soft. We don't like this mantle. But maybe this is it's because we don't have this mantle, this old hairy, itchy thing that our young men don't want to preach. Our young, ma uh, young ladies don't want to serve God. Who will take the place of the preachers of today? There's a number of young men here. Can God call you to service? I remember when he called me. I mean, I didn't. I wasn't looking for this, but I was. I was taught that, you know, when you gave somebody something, you gave it all. It wasn't yours anymore. When I gave Jesus my life, yeah, he just had the right to everything I owned. And so there, there, there I was trying to uh, just be a good Christian inside my church, and one day God says, Larry. I need a preacher. I didn't know what to call it. I, I was so young in the Lord, I didn't know much about anything. I went to my pastor after the church service, and I said, I had this thought. I said, you know, uh, what, is, what is this all about, that, you know, God wants a preacher and wants me to be a preacher? What is that all about? Because I, I, I was so, I didn't know much. And he said, well, I don't know. Uh, he says, uh, you haven't been in church here very, very much. He says, uh, and he, he said, Let, let's just sit down. And he took me through scripture and showed me qualifications that came to a preacher. And he gave testimony about how people were called. And he looked in the word of God with me. And we looked to see how God moved in men's hearts. And growth. he says, you know, you need to find out what God's doing with you. And he says, I can't say this. He said, but you need to find out what God's doing with you. And if God, this is the will of God, he'll make it known to you as, as sure as your salvation. This call will be upon your life, and you can't move. Well, God did so. And I heard other, people, other young men saying, oh, God called me this. And I heard other older preachers saying, yes, God called me. And I fought the call, and I ran from God, and God did this, and God did. You know, I was so dumb and so young in the Lord, I guess, I didn't know you are supposed to run. So when God says, come, serve me, I said, yes, Lord. I'll serve you. He had to make it clear. That's what my pastor said. You make sure you know. When you know, you do what he tells you. And God called me. The hardest thing I have ever done is serve God as a preacher. This mantle has been a headache to me, I don't know how many times. It's broken my heart, broken my family's heart. You know, and we have gone through so many things because of this mantle. But my Savior deserves it all. So every morning I get up, I put it back on. Because it's the mantle he gave me. You know, I wish I could pass this on, but I can't find anybody to pass it on. I stand there in the mouth of the cave with my hands over my face. And I think... Lord, who could I pass on? Who's my Elijah? And I can't find anyone. I preach in churches in the states, and I can't find anyone. You know, and everybody recognized Elijah by his mantle, but 
my goodness, how heavy a thing this was. You know, this mantle that he, he wore was a mantle that, I guess, came with contention. You know, because of this mantle, you know, he, he stood in, in Naboth's field and says, Ahab, you're the king of this place, but you're wrong. You did this wrong. You, you stole this and you murdered a man just to get this. How many preachers will stand in the face of people today and say, hey, this is wrong, this is sin, it's terrible, you shouldn't be doing this. The world is going a certain way, but we as Christians should not be going this way. And king, I don't care if you're uh, an Albanese or whoever it is, you're wrong, it's sin, and you shouldn't do it. But we don't do that. Contention. He stood there on Mount Carmel with 450 prophets of Baal. And he had the courage as they're over there cutting themselves and, and calling out to their God. And he says, hey, maybe he's asleep. You're making fun of that other religion. Where's, the, where's your love, buddy? How, hey, Elijah, why, why are you not uh, uh, trying to get along with these people? Because it's idolatry. It's sin. It's wrong. And so he mocked them. And he says, hey, you can't do it, can't you? Because your God's not a God. And so what happens? They have tore up the whole place. Elijah builds his altar, puts a wooden place, puts a wa water over the top of it. And without any great, you know, voice, not loud or anything else, almost like that still small voice, he says, Lord, would you bring the fire? Lord, would you show that you're the Lord God of Israel? Man, it came down. But he stood against what was wrong, the religion of the day. Where do we stand? Now, I don't know about you, but it seems like, you know, he stood against all those that tried to make their children pass through the fire, and yet we're against abortion, but we don't, we're not too vocal about it. We're against sin, but we're not too vocal about it. You see, I believe every preacher should, be, should still be saying, thus saith the Lord. Notice what, what he says in verse 10. Look at what he says in verse 10 here in this chapter. God just asked him in verse 9, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altar, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it. Only one person, really. But he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord. Now you know that word jealousy doesn't mean jealousy like we're jealous, covetous. It's not that word, kind of word. It more or less means there's a zeal about him. And there's a longing about him that he has for God. And he holds God in high esteem. And he wants only that, that which God wants. And he wants God's uh, word and God's will to be done. And he's jealous over that matter. And so he, he says, I've been very jealous. But, you know, I'm finding fewer and fewer people who are jealous for God. Finding fewer and fewer that want to take the mantle. I'm going to close with this. See, when God calls a man, he calls him to wear a mantle. He says, I'm not going to use you if you don't have the mantle. I'm not going to use you if you don't put on something that's going to recognize, you'll be recognized by. There'll be a code and a standard that you'll, that you'll live by. There'll be things that you'll be known by. And yet we look around us and why can't we find uh, young men and young ladies to serve the Lord? Because we're losing our qualifications. It's hard to find anybody that's just qualified to serve God. It's hard to find busy people. You know, a church like this, so many things going on, and, uh, and I know there's a number of you here who do things, but can God interrupt that and say, hey, I need you? See, when God called me, I got into church, and I think I told some of this story, 
uh, you know, and the pastor got up, and I was just new. I was a new Christian, didn't know what went on. And the pastor says, hey, I need the help. And, uh, and so I have a job for you. I thought everybody was going to get into this. And so uh, I didn't know what you did in church. I was just a new Christian. And he said, hey, uh, I need somebody to take this job. Uh, you know, and it's cleaning the toilets. Can somebody come and clean the toilets? I threw my hand up, you know, thinking I was, I was get a chance to beat the others out in church for this. Because I didn't know what you did. I said, me, me, pick me, pick me. Can I have it? Can I have it? And guess what? I got clean toilets for the church. Every job that came along, I was yelling out first. The new kid on the block, I got all the jobs. Come to find out, no one else wanted them. I was the only one putting a hand up. That broke my heart. But you see, this mantle was there in the waiting. And I was starting to be prepared for it. And God started doing things. And God started working in me to get me ready to put a mantle on. You know, because I didn't have the strength to carry this mantle at that time. I didn't know the cost of it. I didn't know the pain of this. But finally, God got me the place. And oh, how the devil stopped, tried to stop me. You know that when I said yes to this, and even before this, the devil stepped in trying to get me to hate my church, to hate God, to not follow through, to give up, to quit, go to another church, do something else. Oh, you don't need that. You don't need that. But God let, sort of let me see this in my pastor. I saw a man of God surrender to God. And he brought in other preachers, and I got to see them. You know, I'm a culmination of a number of preachers throughout a long time. There's a man who, who went right alongside Gypsy Smith and D.L. Moody. He came and put something inside of me. His name was Hyman Appleman. Hyman Appleman helped, helped me. I've heard number, a number of the greatest preachers in the world, but every time it was God just saying, your mantle is going to need more strength. What I have for you, you're going to need all these men in your life. And so I'm standing before you today as a culmination of all these men down through the ages who have put something inside of me, and I'm trying to put something inside of you, saying, take up your mantle. Can we pass a mantle on? Can somebody take the job? Will somebody become a, a, a pastor? Will somebody become a missionary? Will somebody come out and, and not just be a part of this church, but to serve God? You can serve God in this church, sure. But can you, is there a next step? Is there a mantle waiting for you? you know, and God's looking for somebody. God had told Elisha, the replacement time is up. There's your man. Give it to him. And yet, I guess Brother Bradlett's looking for somebody to pick up a mantle. I'm looking for somebody to give my mantle to. So we just wear it. We're getting older. How much longer we have, no one knows. Our life is but a vapor. Here for a little time, vanishes away. But God has a mantle. When God gave me this mantle, I didn't know what it was going to be like. And so I packed my kids up and put them on a plane. And we came to Australia. Scared to death, didn't know what was going on. You know, and we found a house to live in that was three times the price of what we paid in the States. Mm -hmm. Had to buy an old car that just looked like it was a wreck. Because that's all the money we had. And I got to Australia. And I went down to the streets of Rockhampton. And I took my mantle and I slapped it. Where's the Lord God of Elijah? Where's the God of my pastor? Where's the God of the Christians that went before me? Because I tell you what, 
I need God here. I need God to do something. I need God in my life because I'm in a place where I'm alone. Or it doesn't seem like there's 7,000 around here. It seems like it's just me. But Lord, this mantle, it's got to have the power of God to come with it. Would you bless me? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, how we need the Lord God of Elijah. Lord, I ask that, Lord, you'd help us to understand there is opportunity to follow the will of God. Lord, I pray you speak to hearts and help them to surrender to the call of God. Lord, give us young men and young ladies who will be willing to serve God all the days of their life. Lord, it's not an easy thing to say, and Lord, it's not something that any man or uh, young lady can ever say that, Lord, uh, this is what I want to do. It's a call. God has to have someone who's surrendered enough to listen. Lord, please speak to our hearts. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Every person who's going to do something for God in their life is going to have to stop doing something for themselves. You're going to have to find a place. And the only way to find a place for God is to remove a place for self. And I'd ask each one of you, my son-in-law's grandfather studied, went to study to be a preacher when he was 51. <coughs> When will you start serving God with all your heart? When will you let him have his way? Every preacher who stands in this pulpit could tell you a story of where they were headed and how God changed that path and God gave him another path. Some of the paths they are on were looking pretty good as far as the world looks. Your path may look pretty good where you're at. Would you give that all up to serve a living God? Will you let God have his way? We were discussing before the service this morning. Boy, it doesn't matter here. We're looking for a preacher. They're not there. Go to America. They're not there either. Why? Because the fringe benefits aren't there. At least the earthly ones. I know God's speaking to some of your hearts. And it may not be to pastor. But what would you give up to serve God in this church? What will you do? What will it cost you? David said, I'll not give that which costs me nothing. When offered a plot of land for the temple. If you're not willing to pay a price, you're not willing. That's all it is. Like he said, it'll cost you. I won't sugarcoat it. It won't be easy. At times, it'll be lonely. At times, you'll wonder where God is. As Elijah did. As Elisha did. But it's time that some folks stood up and said, Here, my Lord, send me. Use me. I'm willing to pay the price because I know what you did for me. Is God going to do it in your life this morning? Is God going to take you, set you apart, move you out? Whatever it is, what does God have to do to get you to take up a mantle, to teach a class, 
to clean the toilets? What does he have to do to get you to prepare to serve him? What number? 252. 252. Let's be upstanding. And let's let God have his way this morning. It may be a time for you to come down and say, Brother Carver, it's time for me to serve you. It's time for me to do your will. Each step I take, my Savior goes before me, and with his loving hand he leads the way. And with each breath I whisper, I adore thee. Oh, what joy to walk with him each day. Each step I take, I know.